so it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to, you know, um, follow my predecessors in thanking the organizers, uh, Carmen, Martin, Shomaditya, and Nagasuma for uh, inviting me to this meeting. And Martin, I'd like to thank moreover because for accommodating my request to give the talk on the first day. I didn't know beforehand that you know he was also scheduling me in the post-lunch, uh, the immediate post-lunch session, which is like usually people call it a very challenging one because you need to keep your audience awake. I find it you know like a really lovely one because you can get away with the most atrocious of comments because everybody's like half asleep. Um, so um, you know, as my title makes it clear, uh, I'll be like bringing together three completely different themes: network games and public health and kind of mix them and really hope like hell like you'll make much sense of it, right? So let's get to what actually I'm gonna talk about. So, you know, uh, I think it's, it was kind of clear from um, most of the talks today that uh, vaccines are actually extremely important in terms of public health. We are really lucky because uh, the previous century has seen the development of quite a few vaccines that has uh, decreased mortality uh, worldwide. Uh, so like this is just a graphic showing uh, just 14 deadly diseases which you know, people can now be protected from because vaccines are available. And yet, uh, we will see that uh, despite the availability of these vaccines, we get new stories like this. So we have, uh, for example, this year itself, a uh, story from New York Times which said that there's been the largest measles outbreak in the last 25 years uh, in the US, uh, a country where actually measles was declared to be eliminated back in 2000. And it's not just a story in the US, worldwide, this has been seen to be true. Um, so for example, uh, Vox uh, came out with this new story that uh, essentially it's not just US, but in you know, Europe and you know, Latin America, you name it, measles is making a global comeback. Um, in fact, the Vox story quoted uh, Amanda Cohn, the senior advisor for vaccines at CDC, saying that uh, essentially, this is because of vaccine hesitancy in a world where people do no longer see measles as a threat. Uh, you know, they're, they're just no longer afraid of it and they have stopped taking vaccines. Yeah. Right, so, and uh, in fact, the World Health Organization uh, uh, came out with this report where they say that essentially there's been a very alarming rise in vaccine coverage gaps which has led not only to spikes in measles, but also in all kinds of other diseases for which vaccines are readily available. So this kind of, you know, is a really worrying trend because whereas you do expect that because of lack of public health infrastructure in countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, also in India, you do expect to see uh, spikes in such vaccine preventable diseases you don't really expect them to see in, for example, Europe or the US. And so one of the uh, big challenges for us is to understand why is it that people would be willing to, you know, put themselves under this risk of, uh, you know, being uh, afflicted with diseases for which vaccines are actually available, uh, instead of actually, you know, going out and getting themselves protected from it. So, um, the reason for this alarming rise uh, of uh, you know, diseases like measles has to do with the fact that immunization uh, through vaccination not only protects the individual who is getting this vaccine, but also protects the community through this herd immunity. Okay? Where if you have a critical number of people vaccinated, it not only protects those who are you know, immediately vaccinated, but also essentially other people who have not been vaccinated themselves essentially would get protected from the pathogen because the pathogen simply can't see them. Okay? They are kind of shielded or screened by these groups of vaccinated individuals. And so in that sense, it's a public good, uh, which already should give you some hint that, you know, where, that this talk is going towards some kind of a game theoretic modeling. Okay? 
Um, we have already had uh, you know, a couple of talks where this number was mentioned, the basic production number. So as was uh, you know, explained by the previous speaker, essentially it's a number which tells you how rapidly a particular um, affliction uh, gets you know, amplified in the population. So uh, initially when a contagion first enters the population, uh, it may you know, catch on or it may just simply die out because the person who was first afflicted with it simply doesn't get an opportunity to pass it on. So initially you get you know, quite a few stochastic fluctuations, but after a while when it gets established into the population, it spreads like wildfire and so you see this exponential growth phase. Eventually you run out of susceptible individuals who you can infect and after that, the disease gradually runs its, it's set to run its course and it will either die out or become endemic in the population. So um, if you look at it over you know, a, large num or a large population size, you, you, you know, essentially smooth out all these fluctuations and you essentially simply look at it in terms of whether the average number of cases which are emanating from a single primary case is greater than one or is less than one. If it is greater than one, then you know, no surprises that it's gradually going to increase, whereas if it's less than one, it's going to decrease and eventually die out. And so one is basically this critical number which tells you whether the epidemic is going to essentially become an epidemic or it's just going to die out. And uh, you can characterize various uh, you know, pathogens by essentially this number so you know, here's just a scale with some estimated basic production number for various diseases ranging from hepatitis C and Ebola, which are you know, about two, to measles, which is about 18, which just tells you that you know, measles is way more contagious than, you know, for example, disease like Ebola. Now, uh, there are lots of uh, you know, practical uses to basic production number, one of them being that you can actually use it to calculate the critical fraction of population you need to immunize in order for uh, epidemic not to break out. So, you know, it's kind of roughly estimated as one minus the reciprocal of the basic production number. And so for measles, which has a basic production number variously estimated between 12 and 18, this critical fraction would be like 90 to 95%. So essentially it means that you need to uh, vaccinate, uh, you know, roughly about more than 95% of the population if you want to prevent a measles epidemic, and which is why presumably uh, measles is making comebacks because if, if even a small fraction of the population decide that they really don't need measles vaccination, uh, essentially you fall below this critical number and you can have measles cases uh, skyrocketing. For uh, flu, it's a much lower number. It's only about 45% uh, or so. And so this tells us that to prevent an epidemic, we don't really need to vaccinate each and every individual, which of course is impossible. Okay? So even without 100% vaccine coverage, you can actually prevent an epidemic, provided you have vaccinated a fraction which is greater than this critical number. And this is essentially what is bringing us to this question of herd immunity, that we need to vaccinate enough people for the population to achieve herd immunity. And so, to understand why uh, we don't have herd immunity, uh, even when vaccines exist, we need to model it. And for this, we need to consider two aspects of it. One is how diseases spread through contact. And for this, you can use an epidemiological model like a, SIR, a stochastic SIR process on networks. And these networks essentially are social contact networks of which each individual is a part. And secondly, how individuals voluntarily take decisions to get vaccinated or you know, maybe to vaccinate their children. And for this, one can use a game theoretic or a you know, strategic choice model for how rational agents make decisions based upon information about the outcomes of the decisions. So the way we model it is we you know, take this usual standard approach where we have three compartments. Uh, corresponding to susceptible individuals, infected individuals, and removed individuals. And we have transitions between these various compartments, you know, which are given by various probabilities, which are functions of the transmission probability, the number of infected neighbors, because this is happening on an explicit social contact network. So each individual has you know, essentially a ki number of neighbors, 
of which we can find out how many are infected, uh, then the average infectious period and the probability with which the individual gets vaccinated. And the epidemic model proceeds as follows. So, you know, you, based upon contact between susceptible and infected individuals, you have an infection as a result of which a susceptible individual goes to the infected compartment. And then the infected individual with a certain probability goes to the recovered compartment. And occasionally, you, of course, also get people, susceptible individuals who get vaccinated. So essentially, at one shot, they go from a susceptible compartment to the removed compartment. Now, this essentially tells you about how the disease transmission is happening. But what is missing over here is how do they decide to get vaccinated? So, you know, essentially, I just mentioned the probability for being vaccinated, but how is it actually going on? So for this, we essentially use a game theoretic framework. Why? Well, essentially, you can see that game theoretic framework is you know, ideal for modeling this kinds of decision making, where you have players who take, you know, who choose between a range of possible actions open to them based upon the payoffs available for those actions. And these payoffs are displayed in a matrix. And I've shown here a particular payoff matrix for what are known as two-person symmetric games, where you have a focal player playing a particular game with an opponent, and each has two possible choices open to them. Let's say cooperate or not cooperate. And now, based upon the focal player's own choice and the opponent's choice, you have various payoffs available to the focal player. So if the focal player cooperates when the opponent also cooperates, then the focal player gets the reward payoff. If, on the other hand, the focal player decides not to cooperate while the opponent cooperates, the focal player gets what is known as a temptation payoff. If the opposite thing holds, that is, the focal player decides to cooperate while the opponent player decides not to cooperate, the focal player gets what is known as a sucker's payoff. And finally, if both players decide not to cooperate, the focal player gets what is known as a penalty for not cooperating. Now, the important thing to note here is that the focal player or the opponent does not know beforehand what the other player is going to do. So they take decisions on what should be their choice purely based upon this payoff matrix and their guess as to what the opponent is going to do. Now, if you put this on the particular framework that we are interested in, the players are essentially individuals who are deciding whether to get vaccinated or not, or whether to get their children vaccinated or not. And essentially what uh, decides whether they will you know, take a decision on not to vaccinate is their perceived risk of infection and their perceived cost of vaccination. Now, this cost of vaccination is not necessarily a monetary cost. It could be simply, you know, like, uh, I don't want to go out and, you know, stand in a queue in order to get myself vaccinated. Or it could be, you know, like, I've heard that there's the side effect to this vaccine. Like, for example, if I give this vaccine to my child, then the child has a higher, you know, risk of becoming autistic or whatever. And you'd say that, well, you know, based upon the perceived side effect, I would rather forego it because, you know, I already know that most people have got vaccinated and the risk of my child catching this infection is next to nil, right? So um, I can essentially, uh, you know, just replace this matrix with a corresponding matrix, which is applicable to my case, where the focal player plays a game with an opponent. Uh, essentially, the choices are to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. And the payoffs essentially are, you know, exact analogies where, you know, if both decide to vaccinate, then uh, they, of course, both pay the cost of vaccination, but neither has the risk of infection. If uh, both decide not to vaccinate, neither pay the cost of infection, but bo both are at high risk of infection. Whereas if one decides to vaccinate, the other decides not to vaccinate, then, uh, you know, the one who decides to get vaccinated pays the cost of vaccine, uh, does not run the risk of infection, but you know, there's still the social cost associated with you know, high, you know, uh, high uh, fractions of people getting, uh, you know, getting the disease all around them. So you know, to put it in a nutshell, this is what the model looks like. So here you have the individuals who are evolving in time. So the various individuals are colored according to the 
state they are in. So they could be in a susceptible state, infected state, recovered state, or a vaccinated state. So the model works as follows. Look at one particular individual, for example, the one which is circled here, which is currently in a susceptible state. So this individual has the following information about its neighborhood. It knows what fraction of its neighbors are infected. So for example, uh, if these are the individuals who are the neighbors of this particular individual, just looking at the colors, you realize that three of these uh, neighbors are inf currently infected. So this allows this particular individual to calculate the fraction of infected individuals. And the individual also knows the neighbors who have been vaccinated and are therefore, or for that matter, have already got the disease and are recovered. So in a sense, those individuals it has nothing to fear from, or those individuals are also in some sense screening it from getting the infection. So here, for example, it sees that there's one neighbor who is already in the recovered state, and so therefore, this constitutes, uh, or this goes into this calculation of what's the fraction of its neighbors which are already protected from infection. Now, based upon these two uh, numbers, it decides to update its payoff matrix. Okay. So how do, you, how do you actually you know, figure out the payoffs associated with each pair of you know, vaccinate, non-vaccinate action choices? So what you do is you look at what are the you know, uh, situations which corresponds to uh, any of the following cases. So for example, you could have extremely low incidence of the disease in your neighborhood and you got extremely low vaccine coverage in your neighborhood. Now, in such a case, if you decide not to get vaccinated, you don't pay the cost of vaccination, it's true, but you also run a finite risk of getting infected. Now, in such a case, it forms a game which is very well known in the game theoretical literature and is referred to as prisoner's dilemma. So uh, this game was developed, I think, back in the 50s by two uh, uh, scientists at the Rand Corporation. And usually it's framed as follows in, in terms of a story. So it says, let's say the police picked up two um, you know, characters in somewhat shady circumstances. Now, they really don't have any hard evidence against either of these people. Okay? So, Mm, their only chance is to you know, put them in separate cells and let's say interrogate them and threaten them with you know, um, the following. So to each person, uh, the interrogator says that, look, um, did you do crime X? Now, if you don't, if you don't admit to this and your uh, you know, friend does, uh, your friend was free because of being crown's witness or whatever, whereas you go to prison for 10 years. Now, each of these individuals has, you know, things, things in the following way. Look, if both of us keep mum, the police really don't have a case against us, so they can just, you know, put us in prison for, you know, suspicion of some crime, but, you know, we'll walk free after a few months. But, if my friend admits to a crime and I don't, then you know, I go to prison for like 10 years. Now what happens if both of us you know, decide to confess? Uh, so then in that case, you know, since uh, both, of, both of them have confessed, they get a slightly reduced sentence, but they still go to prison because you know, neither of them are, can claim to be Crown's witness. So let's say both go to prison for five years. So in that case, uh, you can write down the payoff matrix in the following form. So you can say that, uh, so this is the, let's say the focal player, and this is the opponent. So the two choices are confess and not confess. Okay. So if both decide to confess, they both go to prison for, let's say, five years. So I call it minus five because it's a negative payoff. You don't, you want to reduce the number of years you want to go to prison for. Um, if both decide not to confess, let's say the police can at most keep them in prison for one year. 
Now, if uh, one decides to confess and the other decides not to confess, the focal player who, who was you know, being a good person goes to prison for 10 years while the other walks free. And symmetrically, if the focal player confesses while the other does not confess, then the focal player walks free and the opponent goes to prison for 10 years, opponent or friend or whatever. Now, given this payoff matrix, what do you think I should do? Suppose I'm the focal player. What should I do? So how many people think that I should confess? Raise of hands, raise hands, please. OK, one, two, three, four. Uh, Martin, I, th I thought you raised your hands. Yeah, uh, OK. OK, a few more, OK, maybe around seven or so. Uh, how many, pe pe how many uh, you know, think that this person should not confess? OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, about the same, OK? All right. So um, those who said should confess, have you taken a course in game theory or economics? Sorry? OK, at least one has admitted to taking a course in game theory. Because usually, Usually, when uh, you know, I ask this question, uh, if it's an audience full of economics or game theory students, they will all say, confess, right? So, and uh, people who come from physics or you know, like social sciences or so, I mean, not economics, would always say, not confess. Okay? And so there's a clear divide. Yeah? OK, so let's, let's work out in the game theoretic way what should be your ideal uh, solution. So uh, you. Uh, think about like this. So you say that, look, uh, I have no clue how the other person will behave. So let's just work it out systematically. Like, if the other person chooses to do action A, what's my best possible strategy? And if the person decides to do action B, what's my best possible strategy? And let's see if I can come out with the best of all these strategies. So suppose the person says, look, let's uh, assume the other person does not confess, OK? So basically, I'm looking at this row, OK? So uh, what's my payoffs over here? So if the other person does not confess, and if I confess, I get a payoff of 0. And if the other person does not confess, and I also do not confess, I get a payoff of minus 1. So which is better, 0 or minus 1? 0 is better, right? 0 is higher than minus 1. So I will confess. Now I see, OK, let's, see, let's say the opponent confesses. So which is the best outcome? So it's minus 5, minus 10. Which is higher? Confess, right? So regardless of what the opponent does, you'd say, OK, I should confess. Okay? But this is the funny part. Your opponent is just as smart as you are okay? and would exactly use the same arguments. Okay. As a result, the other person also confesses, and you end up with essentially going to prison for five years. Now, if both of you were not so smart and just you know, decided to you know, forget all your game theory, you would have just gone to prison for one year. Right? So this is the you know, thing. You're being rational. You're just trying to maximize you know, your uh, kind of payoffs and so on. And you end up actually worse off than if you hadn't known so much game theory. Right? So this is why, you know, in some sense, it's a dilemma. I mean, OK, it's a dilemma also to, for the individual prisoners. But it's also a dilemma in the sense that how is it that trying to maximize personal utility ends up in the situation being worse off for both players? Yeah. So um, in a sense, I mean, the vaccination problem under certain circumstances, provided you know, the vaccination coverage is pretty low, and the threat of infection is also pretty low, is mappable exactly to this kind of a situation, where each person would you know, be uh, much happier if manages to you know, reap the benefit of herd immunity without actually having to pay any price for it. Yeah. However, it turns out that if you change these numbers, you actually can totally change the quality of the game. And so from a prisoner's dilemma, you can actually get to what is known as a hog duff or a chicken game. So this is where you have a very high uh, disease incidence, and you also have a high vaccination coverage. So what's the hog duff game? So uh, this story is now framed in a completely different term. So 
This is, uh, uh, if you're a fan of 1950s Hollywood movies, you would be very familiar with this game of chicken, where there's two typically, you know, teenagers, you know, all kind of leather jacketed and so on, will each get into a car and would drive at each other at high speed. Okay? The idea is like to show who is more macho. Now, how do you show it? Well, the one who swerves first from the path of the oncoming car, you know, is essentially the chicken. Right? Or he's chickening out. Now, if we work out the payoff matrix for this one, essentially, you know, it's like swerve, not swerve. So you can work out all the payoffs and so on. But here, unlike in the prisoner's dilemma, you realize that the cost of both individuals deciding not to swerve is extremely high because both go to hospital, you know, extremely you know, critically wounded or injured or whatever. So unlike in prisoner's dilemma, where the uh, you know, temptation to unilaterally not cooperate hoping that the other person would cooperate uh, was essentially the best outcome. Here, of course, uh, because the cost of not swerving is so high, the situation is not so clear. Okay? So you, know, you would uh, essentially say that, well, you know, maybe it's some kind of a mixed strategy where you know, I would, you know, with some probability, swerve and with some probability not swerve. So you can you know, work out the possible equilibrium solution for this and so on. So, uh, just by changing these numbers, which corresponds to the disease incidence and the fraction of people who are vaccinated, you can essentially change the nature of the game from a prisoner's dilemma to you know, this kind of a chicken game. Or in other circumstances, you can make it a game which is known as harmony, where it's you know, much more advantageous to, you know, for everyone to be the good guy, for everyone to you know, be, uh, do the right thing, get themselves vaccinated. So this is typically what happens when the risk of infection is very high because the disease incidence is very high, and the coverage, vaccine coverage, is extremely low. So then it's a uh, you know, no-brainer that you, know, you should go and get yourself vaccinated. Okay. On the other hand, you could also have this other situation as deadlock where uh, the disease incidence is very low and the vaccine coverage is very high, where again, you know, it may seem like a brainer not to get, go and get vaccinated. Okay. So based upon you know, where you are on this, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, qualitatively what kind of game you're playing, uh, you can frame your payoff matrix. And once you have the payoff matrix, you essentially solve it to find what should be your ideal strategy. And that gives you the probability that of getting vaccinated. And you then use that probability to decide whether to get vaccinated or not. So this is kind of how the game kind of works. Uh, let me just work in, uh, walk you into a bit of the details. So um, essentially, as I mentioned, that we have this two-step process where you, know, you have uh, infection or recovery happening uh, you know, among various individuals. And this essentially results in updating the elements of this payoff matrix at every time instant. And this essentially is used to decide whether to get yourself vaccinated or not. Now, um, once you get this payoff matrix, there's a, a very rigorous way of actually working out the right strategy for you to adapt in order to maximize your payoffs. So this is what actually made John Nash famous, uh, you know, how many of you know about John, John Nash? All right, everybody, okay. I, I, I think uh, most of you might have seen Beautiful Mind, right? Uh, yeah, so, uh, but um, unfortunately, the, the portrayal they had in the movie of Nash Equilibrium, or how Nash figured out this Nash Equilibrium is actually complete nonsense, right? Okay, so um, uh, essentially, you can, you know, pretty easily work out that the probability of you being vaccinated, or uh, you know, agent J getting vaccinated, is essentially related to the entries of the payoff matrix, essentially in a very simple expression. Okay? So all you need to do is evaluate the entries of the payoff matrix, and then work out what's the probability of an agent of getting vaccinated, and then using this probability random number, person 
uh, vaccinated with this probability that's not to get vaccinated with one minus this probability. So that's pretty much how it works. So um, in a slightly more detailed uh, form now, let's work out where is this information that this person is using to work out the P of matrix entries coming from. So as I mentioned, the two pieces of information that is critical for evaluating this P of matrix entries are the following. FP, which is the fraction of neighbors who are protected against prevalent infection, either by having moved onto the recovered state by being previously infected, or because they have been vaccinated. And the other key uh, factor is the fraction of infected agents. And uh, this is where, in some sense, the, the information that is available to the agent becomes very important. So how do you figure out the fraction of infected agents? So you could either be relying on mass media, which will tell you globally over the entire population in a particular region, you know, what's the fraction of infected cases that have been reported. So that's like global information. Or you could you know, just find out in your own neighborhood, you know, just through you know, grapevine or you know, just listening to people talking, what's the you know, fraction of cases that are happening. So whether you use local information, which is basically the fraction of infected neighbors to the total number of neighbors, or whether you're using global information, which is the total number of infected cases to the total population, uh, you can give assign different weights to them. So if you are using uh, alpha equal to zero, for example, which means that you are relying entirely on local information, you get one situation where, you know, essentially, based upon local information, you're deciding what is your risk of getting infected. On the other hand, if you use alpha equal to one, which means essentially this term drops out and you're only relying on the global information, then you're using, in some sense, the information from mass media to decide, you know, how likely you are to get infected. And it turns out that whether what kind of information you use actually plays a very important role in governing how successful this vaccination is going to be. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, after you have evaluated this uh, various P of matrix, which themselves are actually very simple functions of the fraction of infected and the fraction of protected individuals. Now, the reason, of course, we chose this particular linear functional form has to do the, with the fact that it also allows us to get unique Nash equilibria. If, if you don't uh, you know, uh, use this linear functional forms, then you can actually end up with multiple Nash equilibria and you have to introduce additional selection criteria. So in order to you know, like make, keep the model simple, we just used this particular form. And uh, using you know, uh, the properties of such games, we could uh, introduce the following inequalities and you, know, you choose a set of values of uh, these coefficients which satisfies this. So we can do a Monte Carlo you know, sampling of all possible values of these uh, entries which satisfies this inequality. And essentially all of these would show qualitatively similar results. All right, so first we did uh, simulations on actual social networks that have been collected by surveys done on uh, individuals belonging to 75 villages in this state. So this is, for example, one particular village which has about uh, you know, 1,000 plus individuals, of which only the largest connected component consisting of you know, 1,100 individuals are shown. So I'm showing the simulations as it's uh, you know, like happening. So essentially, in the case where you have uh, local information, you find that the situation is quite different from the one that you see in the case where you have global information. So qualitatively, you can see that when you use local information, you typically tend to have fewer individuals infected than the one where you use global information. Now, is that just you know, perception? Well, not quite. So if you look at the uh, evolution of the individuals at different states, as a function of time for the case where people use local information versus the case where people use global information, you find you know, quite a bit of difference. So typically, people, when in the case where people use local information, you have less people who are actually infected. So this is the susceptible individuals. These are the vaccinated individuals. These are the recovered individuals. And these are the infected individuals. So over time, you find that more people uh, get infected with the disease in the situation where people are using global information to decide whether to get vaccinated compared to the situation where they're using local information. And that's 
partly because in the case we use global information, the vaccination coverage is actually pretty low for you know, uh, a significant amount of time until suddenly people realize that there's an epidemic raging amongst them. And then at suddenly the vaccination rates shoot up. But you know, essentially, by the time they kind of decide to get vaccinated, the epidemic has already taken hold. So if you look at the asymptotic uh, number of asymptotic fraction of individuals who get infected and the asymptotic fraction of uh, uh, individuals who get vaccinated as a function of the basic production number, you find that uh, you know, systematically, uh, the situation where you use local information, much fewer people get infected than the case where you use global information. Now, if you look at the fraction of people getting vaccinated, the situation is slightly more uh, complicated. Uh, for low reproduction number, high reproduction number, it's still true that uh, for cases where you use local information, more people get vaccinated. But in this intermediate value of R0, something funny is happening. So here, people using global information see a you know, higher fraction of people getting vaccinated, but that does not translate into higher number of people being protected. So this is because essentially it's what John T. talked about uh, in a completely different context. It's too much, too late. Okay? So what is happening when you're using global information is that people essentially just hang around for a long time, not realizing that there's a you know, big epidemic loose among them. By the time the prevalence globally is high enough, such that you know, they set up and take notice, of course, they you know, like start rushing about uh, getting themselves vaccinated. But by the time, it's just too late because the epidemic has already taken hold in the entire population. And uh, despite the high vaccine coverage, you actually don't uh, see a you know, reduction. In fact, you see a much larger final epidemic size than in the other case where you were using local information. So it turns out that this is not just uh, true for a particular you know, empirical social network. It's also true for you know, artificial networks that uh, you know, essentially people study, like for, for example, the Erdos and Reni random network. So let me stress that the empirical networks that we are studying is actually extremely different from the Erdos Reni random network. So the fact that you actually see very similar behavior happening in the two networks tells us that the results are actually robust with respect to uh, microscopic structure of the networks. They only depend upon the average degree, the average number of connections that individuals have. So in fact, uh, you can actually work out various quantities as a function of the average degree and show that you know, the adosh reni random network and the empirical social networks actually only depend upon the average degree. And the results are also you know, pretty much robust with respect to system size, for, uh, you know, particularly so for the case of global information. For the case of local information, essentially at smaller system sizes, you see slightly different behavior, but essentially they converge to you know, a very uh, you know, universal behavior once you have a sufficiently large system size. Now the reason why you have this deviation of small system sizes has to do with the nature of the transition from very low disease incidence to very high disease incidence as you change the basic production number. Because in the language of physics, what you see is essentially a transition from a discontinuous transition at uh, local information, when you are using local information, to a case where you see a continuous transition or a second order transition when you are using global information. So essentially what we are showing over here are the probability distribution of the asymptotic fraction of population who are vaccinated uh, as a function of the basic production number for different values of alpha. So remember, alpha is the weight that you give to the global information. So if you are using zero, that means you are essentially only using local information. If you are having alpha equal to one, that means you're only using global information. And you can see that from a situation where you have coexistence of extremely low fraction of people vaccinated with extremely high fraction of people vaccinated at certain ranges of basic production number, you have a situation where it's almost a monotonic curve. And in fact, you can characterize this bimodality of the distribution with you know, certain metrics. So for example, we've used bimodality coefficient. So this shows that for 
low values of alpha, you actually have a coexistence of low vaccination outcomes with high vaccination outcomes for you know, quite a large range of base production number, which gradually you know, decreases until at around alpha equal to 0.5, you only have something like a continuous transition from low vaccination to high vaccination as you change the basic production number. So uh, to conclude, um, you know, we certainly need to understand the reasons for vaccine hesitancy as uh, otherwise it can reverse the success that uh, vaccination has had in the previous century in uh, achieving uh, the goals of public health, essentially eliminating diseases. And what we find is that essentially this you know, refusal to take vaccines uh, has a kind of a dependence on the decreasing incidence of disease. So the, the less people see a certain disease, the more likely they are to avoid the vaccination because they think you know, they really don't need to get themselves vaccinated. And so therefore this reduced risk perception is essentially what drives uh, vaccine hesitancy. So we model this by coupling the spreading of an infectious disease on a social network with a game theoretic model, which essentially tells each agent whether to you know, get themselves vaccinated or not using certain strategies. Uh, the, from a game theoretic point of view, what uh, is actually unique about this model is that uh, the payoff matrix actually varies both in space and in time. So unlike uh, other uh, models which have actually used game theory to understand vaccination, here every individual is like using its own neighborhood information to evaluate its risk and you know, the possibility of getting away with not getting vaccinated. So every individual's payoff matrix is unique uh, because its neighborhood essentially is different from any, every other individual. It also changes over time because you know, as the epidemic runs its course, both the fraction of its neighbors who have got the disease and the fraction of neighbors who have got vaccinated changes. And so therefore payoff matrix also changing over time. So this results in different parts of the network, individuals actually playing very different kinds of game. Some are playing prisoner's dilemma, some are playing chicken, some are playing harmony and so on. And so what we're trying to understand is the collective dynamics of this very heterogeneous situation where different individuals are playing different games and figuring out what kind of collective outcomes would result. And we are primarily interested in understanding what role does the source of disease prevalent information play on the collective outcome. That is, if people are using mostly local information versus if people are using mostly global information, we find the situation can be starkly different. So for example, uh, when people use mostly local information, so they look at the disease prevalence in the local network neighborhood, we see typically a higher vaccine coverage and a lower final epidemic size as opposed to the situation where people use mostly global information. Uh, the fact that our results are not affected by population size, structural details of the network, like for example, whether the network has a modular structure like in the empirical network or homogeneous like in the model networks that we looked at, but only depends on degree, means that in principle we can use the lessons of this modeling framework and understand uh, the actual situation that is prevalent in uh, you know, various uh, uh, vaccination outcomes that we see in reality. Um, in particular, our results are pointing towards the importance of having a mechanism by which real-time local information about disease prevalence uh, should you know, be you know, made operational in uh, the cases of extremely deadly disease epidemics. Uh, and it should play a very positive role in you know, prompting people to go and get themselves vaccinated during such epidemics. Okay, so I'd like to end by uh, thanking um, uh, the various uh, people who made this possible. So the uh, work is actually an uh, outcome of three of my postdocs who have very, three, uh, very different backgrounds. So Anupama, who has a background in public health epidemiology, Shakti Menon, who is uh, uh, essentially a mathematical modeler, and Sashi Devan, who's a game theorist. So the, I was lucky to have these three postdocs you know, working with me simultaneously who essentially made this possible. And Anupama is responsible for finding this cartoon which wonderfully summarizes the fact that you know, even a six-year-old can actually work out why vaccine hesitancy is a big problem. Okay, thank you.